Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com. In 1988, scientific fraud was rampant. The U.S. Congress held a hearing about it, and PBS made a show discussing it. Let's watch a few minutes of that video, and then discuss what's happened since April 1988. Tonight on NOVA. Most scientists take great care with their research, but what happens when they don't? It doesn't take much to take a little bit of the data, change it the way you want it to look, and then publish it. Um, and it's impossible to detect that. With more and more scientists doing more and more research, it is difficult to detect and correct mistakes. Is fraud increasing as a result? Do scientists cheat? Fraud, misconduct, misrepresentation, cheating. Not exactly what first comes to mind when one thinks about science. After all, science is supposed to be the pursuit of truth, and one doesn't discover truth by faking it. Science works on an assumption. The assumption is everybody is being truthful. That if somebody says, we did an experiment, and they tell you how they did it, what they say is accurate. It's accepted that what they say may turn out to be wrong for factors beyond their control because of things they didn't think of, things they didn't know about at the time. But it is assumed that if they say we did an experiment, here are the data points, that those really are the data points. That's the whole foundation of science. If that foundation is breached, well, then you really have nothing left because everything you build upon it is build, building on sand. It's meaningless. The 1980s have witnessed a flurry of scientific fraud and misconduct cases, including a number of cases as yet unresolved. As a result, concern over cheating and research is at an all-time high. Though most of the cases have occurred in the biomedical field, they've thrown a shadow over all of science. This morning, the subcommittee will focus on scientific fraud and misconduct in connection with scientific research. Those who engage in inappropriate practices represent a significant threat both to the integrity of science and the confidence of its public and private sponsors. A scientist who cheats injures other scientists by misleading them, and he injures the public by wasting their money and sometimes by falsely claiming discoveries that directly affect the public health and welfare. After the initial inquiry by this committee into this subject, the committee has had growing reason to believe that we are only seeing the tip of a very unfortunate, dangerous, and important iceberg. Cheating in science is nothing new. Perhaps the most celebrated of all cases occurred in the early 20th century when a doctored orangutan jaw and fragments of a human skull were buried in the gravel off Piltdown Common in southern England. Sometime later, these artifacts were discovered by amateur geologist William Dawson. Dawson's Piltdown Man was quickly accepted as the missing link between man and ape. It made a particular stir in England, where it was hailed as proof that the earliest man was indeed British. Though Piltdown Man was reduced to the status of a puzzling anomaly by subsequent discoveries, it wasn't until the 1950s that new dating technologies finally proved it a hoax, a half-baked fraud that had conned almost an entire generation. A few weeks after that 1988 congressional hearing about scientific fraud, NASA's James Hansen appeared before Congress to talk about global warming. He told Congress that global warming had begun. The hearing was sponsored by Senator Tim Wirth from Colorado. PBS later asked Senator Worth, how did you know about James Hansen? He responded, I don't remember exactly where the data came from, but we knew there was this scientist at NASA who had really identified the human impact before anybody else had done so and was very certain about it. So we called him up and asked him if he would testify. Believe it or not, we called the Weather Bureau and found out what historically was the hottest day of the summer, 
Well, it was June 6th or June 9th or whatever it was, so we scheduled the hearing that day, and bingo, it was the hottest day on record in Washington, or close to it. It was stiflingly hot that summer. At the same time, you had this drought all across the country, so the linkage between the Hansen hearing and the drought became very intense. The hearing was actually held on June 23rd, and Senator Worth was correct. June 23rd, 1988 was by far the hottest on record in the United States. The long-term trend is downward, but they cherry-picked a very hot day in 1988 to hold the hearing. The drought in 1988 was so bad that the Mississippi River nearly dried up. It was very hot that day, and the night before, Senator Worth and James Hansen from NASA went into the hearing room and sabotaged the air conditioning system. What we did was went in the night before and opened up all the windows. I'll admit it, right? So the air conditioning wasn't working inside the room. So when the hearing occurred, there was not only bliss, which is television cameras and double figures, but it was really hot. So Hansen's given this testimony, you've got these television cameras back there heating up the room, and the air conditioning in the room didn't appear to work. So it's sort of a perfect collection of events that happened that day, with the wonderful Jim Hansen, who was wiping his brow at the witness table and giving this remarkable testimony. So the global warming story began in earnest with NASA's James Hansen altering the temperature inside the room. Tom Carl at NOAA apparently wasn't happy with James Hansen's stunt. A few months later, this was the front page of the New York Times. U.S. data since 1895 failed to show warming trend. And Tom Carl told the press, Analysis of warming since 1881 shows most of the increase in global temperature happened before 1919, before the more recent sharp rise in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. While global climate warmed overall since 1881, it actually cooled from 1921 to 1979. In spite of all the well-publicized concern about global warming, you must understand that there is still considerable uncertainty among scientific experts about a number of critical factors which determine global warming, NOAA Administrator John Now said. Other agencies didn't accept James Hansen's climate alarmism. And ten years later, Hansen wrote this paper expressing his frustration that the United States wasn't warming as he had predicted. In fact, his own data showed that the United States had been cooling for the last 70 years of the 20th century. The way that James Hansen responded to the failure of his theory wasn't by modifying the theory. Instead, he altered the data. Over the next few years, he changed this cooling trend into a warming trend by altering the U.S. temperature data. In 1999, he showed the year 1934 more than half a degree warmer than 1998. But then he made large alterations to the U.S. temperature data to make 1998 warmer than 1934. He created a fake warming trend which doesn't actually exist. And this fake warming trend became the basis of some very damaging public policy. President Eisenhower warned about this in his farewell address in 1960. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. And that's exactly what happened. Public policy has become the captive of academics who are willing to alter data and cheat. Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, recently wrote, the case against science is straightforward. Much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Civilization can't function for very long off of fraudulent science, but unfortunately that's where we find ourselves at in the year 2021. We have dishonest scientists controlling many different aspects of public policy. And unfortunately, the press corps and social media are just as corrupt as these academics are. They're working very hard to keep the public from hearing any information which disputes the official misinformation from government agencies. So it's up to good dogs like Toto to set the record straight. You can visit him, Curie, and Caesar on the web at realclimatescience.com.